Okay, it's a participation morning, brothers, sisters, and beloved folks at home. And here's your job. Right this second, this very moment, ask yourself with full honesty. I am asking you right now, what is your goal? Or alternately, what are your goals? And while you're thinking, know that before too long, I'm going to ask you the first question again and try to make all your goals a goal. As our Lord and Savior, the Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the greatest genius of all time, took 528 laws of Torah and said, let me just sum them all up, especially for simpler minds like my own. Thank you, Jesus, for saying it is this, love God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is the same as the first. It's all the same goal, love neighbor as self. Love God with everything, and when you do, you will love your neighbor with everything, and you will love yourself with everything. It's a win, win, win. That's your only goal. But now let's get honest. When I said, what's your goal? How many said to love God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love neighbor as self? I don't see a lot of hands. Because we're all like Peter, which is just fine. Peter, <laughs> Cephas, that one, Simon Peter, son of who? Jonas? Jonah. Jonah, thank you. I was like my biblical expert. We have goals more like Peter than Jesus, but we got plenty of time to make that adjustment. There is the tension in this gospel. Sometimes it's our most loving impulses that make our highest goal, or goals, something a little less than God intended. And it's ironic, and we, a little bit, we can feel victimized by this. Wait a second, God, you gave me a good brain, you gave me a good heart, you gave me faith in you, you and in Peter's case, you even gave me the Messiah in my presence. I can smell him. The Son of God in flesh, right there. What? Wow. What a generous thing, God. You must adore me, and my goal is to protect that Messiah from needless death and suffering. Who would argue with the wisdom of this loving goal of Peter? I wouldn't. It would take that same Jesus to go, oh, you missed. And that's why we should all actually feel good if the goal we stated was not to love God with heart, mind, soul, and strength and love neighbor as self. Because someone as smart and faithful and insightful and courageous as Peter could still get it wrong, be even misled by his love. I know a guy who's like a lot of American men, he grew up pretty well off and felt that sort of, uh, and I use this expression without accusation, noblesse oblige, which is French for the obligations of nobility. And he had a great education. He went to prep school. He went to a good college. He married, uh, I, I, I want to keep him completely anonymous. He married the daughter of a famous politician, and he was an attorney, and a really good guy, and played guitar at his Episcopal church. Loved this guy. And I was talking about, about, about goals. He said, you know, it's weird, but my only goal lately is I want to have $10 million. And this is a reasonable goal. He only had three or four. And it was not really very greedy, actually, by the standards of his universe. It was actually almost modest. Well, because he was a bankruptcy attorney, in 2007 and 2008 alone, he made over $10 million. And he achieved his goal. And really, kind of like, well, what to do next? So what he did was he doubled it to 20. Now, again, before we judge, before we laugh, how many of us have done something as uninspired of that? Well, let me just confess, I've done things far less inspired than that. I would have thought, how will I blow $10 million or whatever? Just 
you know, make this more about me and um, less long term and short term. And that's also a problem. Look at our goals sometimes. What's their time component? How much of it is just sort of a short term thing that we really haven't thought out sufficiently? And more importantly, we haven't prayed out sufficiently. Had Peter prayed when Jesus said, here's what's going to happen. Jesus did not say, I'm thinking of getting crucified. Jesus said with absolute, resolute positiveness, without a doubt, he knew this was his destiny and it was the right thing. We have the option when we're in these moments when God puts something on our hearts that it's going to be this way. This is what I want from you. And you know it right here. That thing that we're created in God's image, that created part of us knows what God wants. To instead of saying, ah, I think that's a pretty good idea, God, but I need to make a few tweaks to that to make it extra good for me, because I know you missed a little bit. No. Instead of making that defensive response, to instead say, I'm going to pray about that. Rather than respond like Peter with, heaven forbid because when we do respond that way, when we insist on re-injecting our own little lowercase w will into the uppercase w will of God, we are going to get rebuked by God one way or another. We're going to lose a job. Our health's going to fade. Uh, someone's going to drive into the side of our car at 50 miles an hour. Something's going to happen to get our attention until we get the message to get Satan behind us and get in the right place with the right stuff and have the right goal that God wants us to have. Now, this is not to suggest that we can't have goals like, I'm going to get a good job after I get a good education. I'm going to, if God should will it, find a life partner and have children, send them to college with my hard labor so they don't have to graduate with debt, maybe. These are all perfectly legitimate goals if that's what God wants us to do. And we'll know if they're legitimate or not if we pray on them. But it will all go so much better if we name the first goal first and let everything else follow. Yes, I'm just re-quoting Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else is added unto you. And that will include your very best goals, which give you the greatest level of happiness. Get God in and get God first. Make divine things your first thought, your first prayer, your first inclination, and the earthly will follow it wonderfully. Now, I'm gonna add a little story. At this very beautiful parish yesterday, we had Joseph and Manny helping our tech game, because as you've noticed now, we're broadcasting 11 or 12 things a week, and nobody's expecting it to stop, even when we start regathering in the sanctuary. So, Epiphany, being a proactive parish, with goals that are rooted in serving God and loving God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, is thinking ahead about the tech. Joseph and Manny, both skilled, gifted, and took the whole thing to a new level. So, before too long, we'll be seeing different cameras, different sound, and especially when we regather, and we're not going to have a camera right in front of the people of the congregation. So this was a great step. While they were here, another person came, and we were talking from socially distanced. We were talking about all the things of the world, politics, uh, quarantine, COVID, 2020, storms, all the stuff that looks like a second coming. <laughs> or the Son of Man coming in His glory. And there was some tension in this conversation because this person, like everybody else, has issues. We're wondering about, am I doing the right thing? Do I feel too strongly about such and such? Am I overly invested in this resentment? Or am I calling God in? Am I really seeking God's will? It was just this wonderful spirit of quest for God, whether it was in the technical or the familial, or the professional. It was just a blessing upon blessing. And sort of the conversation ended, Joseph and Manny were finished, and like, it was time for everybody to go, and 
God, in God's goodness, gave me this idea. I take no credit. I said, let's do communion on a Saturday in the middle of the day. We came to this altar. And we grabbed this ciborium from this armory. And we had the little seven-minute hurry-up communion that you can do in the Book of Common Prayer, a real Episcopal service for those who want to know. And we gave ourselves goosebumps. The Holy Spirit was so pure and beautiful in here. Not because we're great, but the four of us, with our faith, we managed to open up the channel to God's Holy Spirit so that for that time, everything we just thought and done was now informed and guided by thoughts of the divine. Divinity came to us. Now, don't say, oh, I wish I'd been there yesterday. Today is going to be just as good. Because in just a few moments, some of you are home sitting there with your little piece of bread and your little sip of wine. Others of you are just saying, no, I just need to use my imagination and I'll partake of the sacrament that way. The Holy Spirit will guide you. But here's what I want you to do. Take that goal. Take those goals. And now, and in the next several minutes, and singing the anthem, the offertory anthem, and hearing the Eucharistic prayer, be saying the whole time, God, bring your divinity, your perspective, your love. Bring the perspective of Jesus to my goals and move them toward loving you with heart, mind, soul, and strength and empower me, empowering me evermore to love neighbor and self as well. And that's going to happen this service.